In this video, we'll talk more about Node.js. In particular, we'll talk more about object, class, and inheritance. And then we'll talk about using modules, and then asynchronous programming using callback functions and something called promise. Let's start with something we already saw in the last video. So here we have a object under and we can create a, another object using object create and uh, we know that this object will be a subject object of Honda and uh, if we look at civic right now it doesn't have any properties of its own and here we can create a property on civic and uh, now civic has one property called model now if we want to look at civic.make we can see that it's taking the property of its super object honda and uh, honda of course has its own make and honda on the other hand doesn't have a model property so if you look at this, it's pretty much what we would expect when it comes to an object inherits another object. This is known as prototype inheritance, and uh, we call uh, the super object the prototype. In this case, Honda is Civic's prototype. The rules for properties in prototype inheritance is actually pretty simple. When we try to read a property and it does not exist in the current object, JavaScript simply looks for it in the prototypes. For example, here, when we try to access a property make and the civic doesn't have it, so JavaScript will look for it in the prototype. But when we try to write a property and it doesn't exist in the current pro uh, object, a new property will be created in the current object. So here, for example, we can say civic.make and uh, we'll say Nissan, for example. And now civic has its own make property and uh, Honda's make property, of course, is different. So. If you look at this, the rules are pretty simple. But what about methods? Well, methods in JavaScript are just properties whose values happen to be functions. So they also follow the rules for properties. That part is clear. The only extra thing is the keyword this in methods. And we need to understand what this refers to. Take this one, for example. So, suppose we say Honda has a property called owner, which is set to car dealer. And we also have a method called print owner. And uh, if we call print owner on Honda, it will print out car dealer. Now, what if we set an owner on Civic? So we know that the owner property does not exist on Civic. So if we set a owner property on Civic, it will create a new property. And now Civic has three properties, model, make, and owner. And uh, if we print owner on civic, okay, sorry, <laughs> I, I thought there's something wrong there, but uh, it's just uh, I mistyped the variable name civic. Okay, so uh, what we uh, what I'm trying to show in this example is that uh, print owner is a method defined on Honda. Yet, when we invoke it on the object civic, the 
keyword this in the method refers to civic, not the object where the method was originally defined. And uh, here are the important things about this. The value of this in a regular function is determined at runtime. Notice that it says a regular function as opposed to an array function which has uh, different rules. A uh, regular function, this is determined at runtime, known as runtime binding. And uh, in a function call, this is bound to the global object in non-strict mode and undefined in strict mode. So a function call, meaning that a call that's on a function rather than a method. A function, remember, is something that exists on its own. For example, if I say this dot x, for example. Now, in non-strict mode, this in this function will be bound to the global object. What we are doing here is basically we are creating a new global variable x. And uh, if we use the strict mode, this, this in a function is undefined and uh, we'll get exception here because we are trying to assign something to a property of undefined. Now in a method call, which is this case, this is a method call. In a method call, the keyword this is bound to the object the method is called on, not the object where the method is defined. This explains why when we call print owner on civic, it uses the owner of civic rather than the owner of Honda, even though it's defined on Honda. There are a few more things about this, uh, which we're not going to cover here. Those are relatively less important things, but if you are interested, check out the link documentation. And uh, remember, all of this apply to regular functions. Uh, a row, uh, arrow function is different because an arrow function does not have its own this. It gets this from outside the function. And uh, this <laughs> means it's generally a bad idea to use arrow functions for methods. For example, let's see this example first. Okay, so here I have a object called car and uh, I'm defining a method called print on this car object. And uh, instead of using a regular function, I'm using an arrow function to define this pr print method. And uh, knowing what we know here, arrow function does not have its own this, and uh, it takes this from outside. We can see that this here, although we may intend it to be mean the current object, but it's actually not the current object, it's something outside. And uh, since we are using non-strict mode, this refers to the global object, and uh, there's no global object. Uh, the, the global object doesn't have properties of uh, make and uh, model. So if we try to call car print, this will give us undefined and defined, which is because this in the arrow function refers to the global object. Uh, if we change this simply from that to a regular function, and if we run the code again, now it prints out Honda Civic, and uh, this is what we would expect. So this is the first example showing that it's generally a bad idea to use arrow functions for methods. And then here is another example, which is uh, a bit 
trickier to understand than the previous one. So let's let's see. First of all, here we are defining a controller ob uh, con constructor object. If you uh, sorry, constructor function. If you remember uh, constructor functions, uh, these functions are the functions intended to create new objects. So in this case, um, this function will take two parameters and then create an object with uh, two properties, uh, plus it will have a method called print. And uh, let's run the first part first. Now, if you use this constructor function to create a new object and you call print, you will actually get make a model of this one. So if we do this, you can see that, let me clear this one out and then run again. You'll get Civic and Honda. Civic and Honda. And uh, it seems to be correct in the sense that it seems to let us to create a method using array, uh, using arrow function. However, if we create a, another object that inherits from car one, and this object will have its own model and make, and if we try to print this one again, you'll see that it prints out Civic and Honda twice. In other words, this print is not taking the properties of this object. It's actually taking the properties of the car one object, which is different from this example we just saw, which is different from this example where when you call it on a, another object, it will take the properties of the other object. Now, the reason for that is a little bit tricky. And if you remember, in JavaScript, there is something called closure. And uh, in an arrow function, it doesn't have its own this. So it takes this from outside the function. And in other words, it actually takes this from here, meaning the newly created object. And uh, because of closure, that newly created object is associated with this function in the future as well, meaning that every time you call print, it will always print out that object, which was associated with this one when this arrow function or this method was created. So it will not do the dynamic binding thing like regular functions. So this is another example of not using arrow functions for methods. Bottom line, don't use arrow functions for methods. And uh, now that we understand the basics of prototype inheritance, the properties, the methods, and so on, let's look at three popular uh, prototype related keywords in JavaScript. Prototype with double brackets, proto with double underscores, and uh, just prototype. So in prototype inheritance, each object has a hidden property that references its prototype. And that property in JavaScript has the name bracket bracket prototype capital P. This property cannot be accessed directly, but you can access it using an assessor property. Remember, an assessor property is basically a getter. And uh, this assessor property has the name underscore proto underscore. Uh, actually, it's double underscore proto, double underscore. And uh, there's a third keyword, which is simply called prototype. And uh, all JavaScript objects 
inherit from object.prototype this object. So here we can, if we want, we can look at proto of Civic. It will show that its prototype is Honda with full properties plus a method. Now, these two, these two things are not quite important. Um, most, uh, most of the time, you really don't need to look at the prototype of an object. The prototype thing, however, is quite important. This is something that you see all the time when you read API documentations. For example, you hopefully have already read some API documentations on the JavaScript arrays. And uh, if you look at the if you look at the documentation here, you can see that most of the array methods are methods of array.prototype, in fact. Uh, but there are also a few of them, like uh, from is array of, which are methods of array itself. So what's the difference here? And uh, what exactly is prototype? Well, the first important thing to remember is that there's no class in JavaScript. Objects are created from constructor functions. Array, in fact, is a function, not a class. The second important thing to remember is that in JavaScript, functions are also objects, which means they can have their own properties. Prototype is simply a property of a function. Now, with that, with that said, proper type, prototype is kind of a special property in the sense that it is used to set the prototype of any object created by the constructor function. Let's see this example. So I have an object here called make. Actually, it's probably better to say it here. Again, let's start with the object Honda, and we will create we will create a function which takes a parameter called model and then create a new object with property model. Now, instead of Let's skip this line first. We'll first skip this Honda car dot property uh, prototype. I keep saying property when I should say prototype. Sorry about that. So let's create an object using that constructor function. I'll call it car one and new Honda car and with model civic, for example. And uh, if we look at R1, it's civic. And uh, if we say car1.make, there's nothing. However, now let's add this one. So now we set Honda as the prototype property of Honda car. The constructor method or constructor function. And uh, let's create another one here. And uh, this time we'll call it uh, a call. And uh, if we say hard to make, notice that hard to make, now we see Honda. And the reason for that is Pretty simple because now the object Honda is the prototype of car two. So this is basically what 
function dot prototype means is simply is a object that becomes a prototype or in other words a super object to any object created from this from this constructor uh, constructor function so why does it matter so why creating such thing that sounds kind of convoluted well the important thing about prototype is that we can now create something similar to java class in javascript even though javascript doesn't have a class for example here we have a java class it's a class called circle and uh, we have a static field called pi which has a constant value and uh, then we have a private field called radius and when we create a circle object we specify a radius and the constructor creates a circle object with that radius and then we have a method called area which will return radius square times pi which will be the area of the circle this is a typical java class but uh, we can't do this in javascript because javascript doesn't have class like java so what we can do however is simulate that using prototype if we want to create something similar in javascript we can start by creating a constructor function this function is responsible for initializing fields like radius there's a bit naming convention here by convention the constructor function will use pascal casing meaning that it will capitalize the first letter of each word and uh, this is to be consistent with the pascal casing used by java class name so when you look at this later on you'll see it is as if a class and also by convention if you have a private field in javascript you you will use underscore to indicate that it's not supposed to be used outside the outside the object javascript doesn't have access modifiers like public private and so on so there's nothing prevent people to actually use it but by using an underscore you are basically saying that you should not access this property directly if you do so you know uh, you are responsible for, for uh, problems later on if the internal of the uh, object changes so for the rest of the class we can also simulate using uh, prototype and the properties of functions we can add any static fields as properties of the constructor function itself like this and uh, any method as a method of the prototype pro property of the constructor function the result is that all the objects created with this constructor function will have their own fields because it's defined here but they also will inherit all the methods from the prototype so they are quite like the objects created from a class in java an alternative to define to defining a method on the prototype is to define it on the object itself in inside the constructor function for example here we are basically saying that the new object created from this constructor function will have a property radius and a method diameter the difference compared to defining the method on the prototype like the area method here is that each object created by this constructor will now have their own copy of the diameter method well they all share or inherit the same array method from the prototype generally speaking 
it's more efficient to have just one copy of the method, which is why you usually see methods defined on prototype rather than for each object, like the array methods. Prior to ES6, there's no class syntax in JavaScript. People came up with different ways to create something that looks like a class, for example, using prototype, and those were called class patterns. Basically, design patterns that mimic class in JavaScript. ES6 actually introduced class syntax like this. Underneath, JavaScript still doesn't have class like in Java. This syntax, for the most part, is so-called syntax sugar, which lets you create constructor functions and prototypes using a class syntax rather than the old pro uh, prototype constructor function syntax that we saw before. Here are a few things about ES6 class syntax. First of all, it's basically a constructor followed by some methods. You cannot have more than one constructor because underneath is still JavaScript. And in JavaScript, each quote unquote class is actually the constructor function. If you have two constructors, it basically means you, it will be two classes. Also, you cannot overload methods because JavaScript simply doesn't support overloading functions. This is surely not a big problem though, because as we saw in the last lecture, JavaScript functions are very flexible with their parameters, so you rarely feel the need to overload a function. You can have static methods in ES6 class syntax, but not static fields. But the later specifications supported, supported stack, uh, static fields. ES6 class syntax also, it's not entirely syntax sugar, as it does provide something more. In particular, it makes class inheritance a little bit easier. This is how you would create a subclass in ES6. It's basically the same syntax, except for extends, which means the same thing as in Java, and also super, which means the same thing as in Java, where you can use super to refer to the superclass. Okay, that's enough about classes and inheritance in JavaScript. Now let's talk about modules. Modules are extremely important for large software projects. You never want to create a complex piece of software as a single big chunk. You want to divide it into smaller pieces, aka modules. So each piece can be independently developed, tested, and maintained. And that will dramatically reduce the complexity of the software. When it comes to modules, there are two important things about them, interface and the dependency. Interface is the API a module exposes to the outside world, and dependency are the other modules this module depends on. In Java, we have packages, which is Java's module system. There's no such thing in earlier versions of JavaScript. I guess because the language was originally intended for writing relatively small pieces of code that run in a web page. When people started to use JavaScript to develop large projects, they came up with a few module systems themselves. The default module system used in Node.js is called the CommonJS module system. In this system, each file is a module. Interface is exposed through an object called module.exports, and the dependencies are loaded by calling the function require. This is an example of CommonJS modules, and uh, let's create this example here. To see how it works. Oops. So here I have a file called a.js, and remember in CommonJS module system, each file is its own module. So I have two 
things here. I have a tungsten and I have a function. If I want to export them so that other modules can use them, I need to attach them to this x modules.export object. And the way to do that is simply creating a new object and then make this to the properties of that object. So basically we are doing foo and then we are doing bar like this. But if you remember, there's a shorthand form since we already have this two here and uh, the property name will be the same as their original name. We can simply say foo and bar. And the way to read this is basically that there's a special object called module.exports and it has two properties, foo and bar, and uh, that would allow other modules to use this too. But anything that's not included in the exports object will not be able to use directly by other code. Now let's then create another file and uh, this one will use whatever exported from the previous one. So the syntax is we'll call a require function and this require function will return the module dot exports objects of that uh, of the required module. So in other words this one will basically return an object with two properties foo and bar. And uh, of course we need to assign that object to an object here and uh, the convention is to use a const, constant, meaning that uh, we don't really want to change anything in the other module, we just want to use it. And then we can use this object to access anything exported, and uh, anything exported are simply properties of this object. So we can say a.foo, and uh, we can say a.bar. And uh, if we run this code, it will, let's run this again, it will print out foo, which is, which is what it's supposed to do. So all in all, it's pretty straightforward. Here are a few things about the require function. Uh, it of course loads a module and returns its module object so that we can use it. And uh, also very importantly, a module is only loaded once when multiple require uh, with multiple require calls. It's actually quite easy to make multiple require calls. For example, here B requires A and uh, maybe B also requires C, for example, and uh, maybe inside the C module, C also requires A. So when B module tries to require both A and C, uh, the A module will be required twice. The good news is, of course, that uh, regardless of how many times you call require, the module will only be loaded once. The syntax for calling require is that if it's a core module, meaning that if it's a module that's part of the Node.js distribution, or if it's a module installed using npm, uh, like using the npm uh, install package, uh, then you simply use a module name. For example, you would just say require HTTP or require request or something like that. Now, uh, if it's your own module, uh, then you need to load it by path, meaning that you need to specify a path to that actual file. A path can be an absolute path or relative path, and relative paths start with either dot slash or dot dot slash, meaning that it's either in the current folder, like in this case, or is somewhere in the parent folder. So you need to specify the actual path 
um, but uh, the dot js extension can be omitted. So here we don't have to say slash dot a dot js, but we do need to specify the path to this file. Again, all in all, it's pretty straightforward. Once you understand the concept of the export object, and then ES6 defined the official module system for JavaScript. And just like CommonJS, uh, each file is uh, a module in this system as well. Uh, but ES6 modules use the export and import keywords instead of the require function. Although Node.js uses CommonJS modules by default, you can use ES6 modules in Node.js as well. Uh, you just need to do a little bit extra work to enable it. You can check out the link documentation to see how to do that. The easiest way is actually just name the file mgs instead of js. m, of course, stands for uh, module. So uh, this is uh, this is an example of ex6 module. And uh, notice that in CommonJS, there's one mod, there's one export object, and uh, everything is uh, is exported as a property of this object. In ES6, there's no such object, or at least uh, there's no such object uh, in the syntax. If you want to export something, you simply put the export keyword in front of it. You can do export foo, export bar, and so on. When you export, there are several ways to do it. One is export individual items, like just what we just did there, or you can export them together with uh, optionally uh, alias. Uh, some people don't like uh, specifying export um, individually because uh, if you have a large file and it's very difficult to find out uh, which item is exported and which are not. So an uh, alternative to that is to do something similar to CommonJS where you group all the exports together. In ex6, you can do that by using the export keywords or export statement, and then group group uh, all the items you want to export together, and maybe put it at the end of the file so that it's easy to find out which items are exported. So you can export them using their original name, or you can export them um, with a new name using um, original name as uh, uh, alias. And uh, when you import them, again, you can import uh, individual items. If you do that, remember you need a pair of braces. So this one will import just bar, and this one will import both um, full and bar. And uh, you can also import an item and then give it an alias. So later on, you can use the alias in your code instead of the original uh, name. And if you want to import all of the items, you can say import star without the braces. But in this case, you have to say, uh, you have to use an alias. You have to say import star as something from that module. Uh, if you compare this one, to this one, you can see that it's basically equivalent to the uh, require, require statement in the common JS, which will import everything and then uh, assign everything to an object. And this one does basically the same thing. Yes, it also let you uh, de designate an uh, exported uh, item as default. And when you import it, uh, you don't need to use braces. So that's an important syntactical difference. If it's not the default, you have to use braces. If it's the default, you don't use it. 
And uh, this one is really just a shorthand form for import braces default as uh, alias. And uh, in ES6, you can do this. OK, that's enough about modules. And uh, let's talk about asynchronous programming. The word asynchronous is, of course, with respect to synchronous which is another way to say uh, the code runs sequentially. The problem with sequential code is that certain tasks take a long time to run, like read or write a file on disk, query a database, or request data from a server. If we look at the code, we notice that certain part of the code may need to wait until the result comes back, but the other parts of the code may be unrelated to the task so they should be able to run without waiting. The problem of having the whole program wait there is that it occupies the CPU, but the task is often performed by something else, like a disk controller or memory controller. It'd be great if we can somehow continue to do the things that are unrelated to the task in parallel to, with the task. One common technique is to use multiple processes or multiple threads. By the way, the difference between processes and threads is that a process can have multiple threads, or sharing the same memory space of the process. Different processes don't share memory. Whether you use processes or threads, the idea is the same. When you have a long-running task, you simply spawn a new process or thread to, to do it, while the current process, process or thread can continue to do other things. This approach is very widely used, but there are some problems. First, the, the operating system must allocate some resources for each proce process or thread. And secondly, Switching between processes and threads, known as context switch, takes some time. If you are on a regular computer or even on a server, these are usually not too big a deal. But on very busy web servers, uh, these are big problems, because you are looking at hundreds, maybe thousands of requests per second, and each request will need a thread or process. This is why Node.js became very popular in server-side development, because it does not incur the overhead of creating and switching lots of threads and uh, processes. There's one more issue about multi-threading uh, or multi-processing, and that's the communication and the synchronization of multiple processes or threads. This is the reason why writing multi-threading or multi-processing code is notoriously hard. But with that said, uh, in web setting, this, this one is not really a big problem because uh, usually you don't need to synchronize all those processes or threads of your web server. So what's the alternative approach? Well, uh, asynchronous programming, of course. If we compare this code with the synchronous code, this one, we can see that the main difference is the part that processes the result is moved to a separate function, often called a callback function. The call to the long-running task will return immediately so that the program can continue to do other things. When the result comes back, the callback function will be invoked to process the result. In asynchronous programming, everything runs in one thread. This avoids the cost of managing multiple threads and uh, the cost of context switch. If you think about it, it's actually no different from what you did in GUI programming in classes like CS2012. Remember in GUI programming, you would create a button, then write some code that will be executed when the button is clicked. The code is called a event handler that handles a button click event. Here is the same thing. 
A callback function is simply an event handler that handles the result is ready event. Let's see an example. We'll use the bcrypt.js package to hash some string. So this is the bcrypt bcrypt.js package. By the way, there's a, also a bcrypt package um, if you try to use bcrypt in your code. The difference is that bcrypt.js is a 100% JavaScript implementation of the bcrypt algorithm, while the uh, bcrypt package relies on some C slash C++ code. bcrypt package is the faster of the two. But if you try to use bcrypt on Windows, it will ask you to install a bunch of C, C++ libraries and tools, and uh, sometimes it causes some problems. So uh, anyway, uh, let's quickly look at the API. So the way to use it is uh, first we do a require, and uh, this will give us the exported object, of course, and then we can call methods on that. And there are synchronous ways to do it, uh, to do things. You use the methods generate sort synchronously or and hash synchronously, or uh, we use the asynchronous way. Well, of course, we want to use the asynchronous way. So uh, let's copy this code. And uh, let me close this one. And uh, let's go to here. So in this project, I already included the package. And uh, so let's just try the code. So here we can say uh, bcrypt and uh, generate sort. This is the uh, what's that thing called? Um, the scale factor or sum factor, and uh, this is a callback function. And uh, let's hash a b c d. And uh, this is another callback function. And uh, let's log the let's print out the result. Okay, so if we run this, okay, maybe I didn't install the package. Module not found. Okay, so that's probably because I didn't install the package. And let's that here go to git no okay so go to git and uh, node examples let's do what we can install Run the code again. Okay, so now it prints out the the hash, uh, bcrypt hash of a b c d, and uh, let's try again. Back. So it's like that. Um, this is a very simple example, but uh, it's quite representative of uh, asynchronous style of programming in Node.js. Uh, in particular, uh, notice uh, first this one. So this whole thing is a method call of gen sort. Uh, 
uh, generate a sort. Notice that it takes two parameters. The first one is a number, and then the second one is a function. So this second one is the callback function, uh, meaning that when the sort is generated, this function will be called. And uh, it's the same thing with the hash method. Notice that this whole thing is the uh, method call of hash. It takes three parameters. It will take uh, a string, which is the plain text will be hashed, and then uh, the sort, which comes from here, and then another function of its own. And this is a callback function. Uh, when the hash is produced and ready, it will be passed to this function, and then this function can print it out. So that's the first important thing about uh, this style of asynchronous programming. Uh, functions tend to take more other uh, take, tend to take a, a callback function, and uh, that callback function will get the result of the previous function call, and then it can do something of its own. The second thing is uh, pay attention to the parameters of the callback functions. And uh, notice that here it says error sort, and here it says error hash. Because a method call could fail, a callback function typically needs to take at least two parameters, an error object and the result object. And inside the callback function, you should typically check if the error object is null. If it's null, it means the previous method call was successful, you can use the object, and if it's not null, you, can, you need to do something. In other words, typically you would have some code like this, if error, and then uh, do something else, then continue with the rest. Uh, same thing for this callback function. Notice that the, the error, ob error object is usually the first parameter, and this is known as the error first callback style uh, used uh, pre uh, pretty much uh, exclusively in uh, universally in, uh, in Node.js. So uh, when you write Node.js code, make sure that if your callback function takes an error object, make sure it's the first parameter using the error first callback style. Okay, so that's one, that's the first example, and then let's look at another example. So in this example, uh, we try to use the FS module provided by Node.js, FS stands for file system, and we try to use this uh, module to open a file on disk and then write something to it. So the actual API is not really important. You can take kind of a, a quick look at the code and get a general idea of uh, what it's supposed to do. Uh, basically, we include the FS module and uh, it provides a number of methods like open, which opens a file, of course, uh, write, which writes to a file, and close, which close an open file. Again, the, the exact uh, uh, API is not too important. Uh, you can kind of tell that this one opens a, a file called test.txt, and the second parameter uh, is a, uh, means append. So we are trying to append additional uh, data to the file. And uh, if there's so this is a callback function of open. Uh, if there's an error, we print out the error. Otherwise, we'll continue with uh, writing to the uh, to the file. So uh, it will open will uh, will result either in an error or a file ID or file handler. And if there's no error, we use that file handler to write a new line in the file and the file write has its own callback function, which takes an error, 
the actual bytes written to the file and uh, also has a string. I don't remember what the string is, but that's not really important. And, and uh, then uh, same thing here. Uh, if uh, inside this callback function, uh, if there is an error, we'll print it out. If there's no error, we'll print this one out. And then we try to close the, the file. And uh, closing the file <laughs> takes another callback function of its own, and this time uh, we only care if there's an error or not, because if there's no error, the file is closed, and uh, uh, there's no uh, other result, so to speak. So this is uh, pretty much the, the, the code, and uh, uh, the main purpose of this example is to show that asynchronous programming is uh, pretty cool. Uh, but uh, if you have lots of nested callback functions like this, the code can become rather messy and hard to read. Uh, this is known as the callback hell or pyramid of doom because uh, when you have lots of callback functions, it becomes like a pyramid. So to address that problem, people came up with another way to do asynchronous programming. Uh, instead of using callback functions, we can use something called promise. Uh, promise is a JavaScript object that has three properties. Uh, sorry, this one. Uh, the first property is a, it's called a executor. It's a function that may take some time to complete. And uh, after it completes, it will set the values of the other two properties called state and result. State started uh, with pending, and once the executor function finishes, or in other words, it's called settled, uh, the state will become either fulfilled or rejected uh, if uh, either it's, if it's successful or there's some error happened. Uh, result will become uh, originally started uh, with undefined and then later on it either takes on a value if the executor function is successful or it has an error object. The way to use a promise object is to use the then uh, method of that promise object. And uh, this method takes two functions as parameters. One uh, process the result if the executor function finishes successfully, uh, and one process the error if the executor method failed. A promise will give us either a result or error. And uh, once a promise is settled, that means the executor function finishes, uh, Either uh, we will get the result or the error, and they will never change. Uh, we can call them multiple times to register multiple handlers, and all of them will get the same result. There are several variations of using a promise. Um, the the uh, then method takes two functions or two callbacks. Um, but if you don't care about the error, you can simply pass one uh, function, and this function only handles the success. So uh, oftentimes it's called the success handler. Uh, you can also, if you, all, if you are only interested in whether it has an error or not, then you can provide now as the success handler and the function as the error handler. Or um, again, uh, if you only are interested in if there's an error, then instead of calling then, uh, you can call catch and uh, simply pass the error handler. And uh, yet one more way to do it is uh, pass a success handler to then and pass a error handler to catch. So uh, all these are valid and uh, somewhat common ways to use uh, a promise. Now, uh, seeing all that, uh, let's see an example of using Promise. The Bycrypt JS uh, API uh, has a nice feature. So uh, when we use the asynchronous methods like gen sort, if we provide a callback function like this, 
it will use a callback function. But uh, if we do not provide a callback function like this, it will return a promise. So uh, previously, uh, when we want to generate a sort, we did this one. And uh, if we don't provide the callback function, this gen sort will return a promise. So we can then call the then method on the promise and then pass a success handler to handle the result, which is a sort that's generated. This is how we can use a promise. But if you look at this code, you'll say, OK, uh, so what's the difference? Right? Uh, the success handler is still kind of a callback function. And uh, uh, if you compare this two, they really don't look uh, too different. Well, the main difference comes when we have to do several asynchronous calls in sequence, like the writing a file example. In this example, uh, we have to first open a file and then write it and then close it. And uh, with callback functions, we have quite messy code like this. But with promise, we can chain those operations in a much cleaner way, like this. We can say first operation, and then the second one, and then the third one. The key to understand promise chaining is to understand, is to understand the return value of the then method. The return value is actually a promise itself. And uh, this promise is based on the return value of the handler function. Basically, if the handler function returns a regular value, this value becomes the result of that promise returned by them. And uh, if the handler function returns a promise itself, the result of that promise becomes the result of the promise returned by them. Or another way to think of it is just if it returns a promise, then uh, return then returns the same promise. That's another way to think of, uh, of to think of it. So either way, um, then we'll wrap the results of the handler function inside the promise. And because of that trick with uh, return value of them, we can try run several asynchronous functions in sequence uh, instead of writing a bunch of nested functions. We can chain them together nicely using the then dot then syntax. So here, we can quickly change our bycrypt example with something like this. So we'll do bycrypt, we'll do gen sort, so remember if we don't, if we don't if we don't um, provide a callback function, it returns a promise. So we'll call then on that. And inside the then, we will have the result of the previous function call. And uh, we will then call the hash method using that. Result. And uh, again, notice that this one is basically this one without a callback function, means that now this one will return a result, which is a hash inside a promise. And uh, that result will be returned by then, which we can then call another then on that and then print out the result of the hash, which is the hash. So if we run the code, so 
this one returns salt and uh, this one crash it. Which part is the error? We need to add a little number. Where is? Gen sort, not air sort. Okay, so now it should work, hopefully. Okay, so this one does work, and uh, let me change this one to print hash and uh, ABCD and sort. Now, yeah, it, it should work. Okay, so uh, it works. Uh, notice that even though the text is the same in in both cases, um, because the generated source are different, um, the results are different. That's not important. Uh, what's important is, of course, uh, the syntax of using promise. Uh, compared to this, you can see that this is a much cleaner way to chain multiple asynchronous operations together. We're only uh, doing two operations, so the effect is not uh, that pronounced, but um, if we look at the uh, right file example, Now it looks. Now it looks quite a bit cleaner than before. So, this is a callback function version, and uh, this is a promise version. So, it's open file and then write file and then close file, and then catch error. So uh, nice and clean. There are a couple of tricks uh, to make this code work like this. The first is that uh, we're using a method called promiseify, provided by the Node.js distribution. And uh, this method basically converts a uh, function that only takes callback functions into something that returns a promise. So we take the original file.open method and convert it into a function that returns a promise. And same thing with this. So this is uh, the first trick we have to do because the original file system.open method does not return promise. Uh, the second trick is that uh, we have to somehow access the file handler or file ID in different places. So I created a global variable here so that uh, later on uh, we can close it inside the uh, inside the different function. Uh, but otherwise, uh, it's the same code as this one, and this one is quite a bit cleaner. And, uh, well, um, I think we never run this. Uh, why don't we run this? Yeah, so basically it's just write a line into a file, and uh, if we use the promise version, it will add another line. So um, the code itself is not important. Uh, it's just an example of showing different styles of asynchronous programming. 
Anyway, uh, coming back, the promise library also provides a few additional goodies. Uh, for example, if you have several promises and you want to wait until all of them are settled before doing something, uh, you can do a promise all and uh, put all the promises inside a, a array. Uh, or uh, if you want to proceed on, uh, when one of them is settled, then you can do a promise race. Uh, as long as one of those promises settles, and then uh, the success handler will be caught. And the JavaScript has two keywords, async and await, uh, that makes using promises even simpler. Async declares a function to be asynchronous, and the return value of that function will be automatically wrapped inside the promise. Await waits until a promise settles and returns its result. Um, await is really handy uh, when you want to get something out of a promise. Uh, the only catch is that await can only be used inside the asynchronous function. So with async and await, With async and await, the file writing example becomes like this. Uh, again, we have to first promise, promiseify the original file system methods so that we return uh, promises. But uh, once we do that, we can create an async function and then simply say await file open, await file write and then await file close. Notice that now we go from here, quite uh, messy and uh, difficult to read stuff, to here, which almost look like uh, they are synchronous code again. This is uh, the nice thing about async and await. It makes uh, asynchronous code look kind of like synchronous code, much easier to read and follow. Now, if you look at this code, uh, you can see that, uh, hey, uh, what up? You may be thinking, what about error? Okay. So the then method takes a success handler and the error handler. However, if you look at async and await, it seems like uh, they only deal with success, but uh, not error. What if there's an exception? Well, um, there are actually two ways um, to handle errors, and both are pretty nice and simple. The first way is you can use the good, uh, now good, uh, good old try catch uh, block. So you can put everything that that uh, await inside the try inside a try block and then you can catch it and uh, this way any of those uh, races are exception it will come here another way to do this is actually this <coughs> so remember asynchronous Asynchronous, uh, the async keyword makes the return value of the function a promise. Means that means that this one is in fact a promise. And if we want, we can catch the error here by saying if uh, the execution of this method. This is a exception, and uh, we'll do it here because the whole thing returns a promise, and the promise has not only a then method but also a catch method. Either of that will be uh, fine, depending on whether you want to catch the error inside the function itself or whether you want to catch it outside the function. Promise uh, is often a confusing concept uh, until you get used to it. Then you realize that it's really nice and uh, 
simple to use. Um, but anyway, when you have time, please check out the promise chapter in the modern Java tutorial, uh, which has uh, more information on promises. And uh, this is the end of this video. See you in the next one.